you will become unrecognizable as you're led by the Holy Spirit. You can become the real deal. You can be transformed to be more and more like Jesus. Who you are now isn't who you have to remain. As you are led by the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit begins to manifest in your life. The favor of God follows you. Bondages are broken. Sin, that power over your life, is broken. And you begin to walk as Jesus walked. Not only that, your life will begin to impact those around you in a very profound way. When you are led by the Holy Spirit, everything changes. You'll go to greater realms of glory. You'll walk in greater dimensions of power. You'll hear the voice of the Holy Spirit with greater levels of clarity. Revelation will flow more freely. Everything about you will begin to change. You won't recognize yourself. I'm talking about true and lasting change. God can do it. but You must be led by the Holy Spirit. If you want that, I want you to write in the comment section right now, lead me, Holy Spirit. Write those four simple words, but let that be a prayer of surrender. Lead me, Holy Spirit. You know, Jesus, he lived as a perfect reflection of the will of God. You and I walk in obedience to God, yes. That's our goal. And sometimes, if we're doing really well, we walk with the Lord even minute by minute. Some maybe in seasons of mistakes, in seasons of stubbornness, in seasons of distraction, they go a little by the wayside and perhaps they walk in step with God on a week-by-week -week basis. Sadly, some even on a month-by-month. -month. But every so often you may find yourself walking minute-by-minute. Minute. Well, Jesus walked not just minute-by-minute, minute, not just hour-by-hour, hour, not just second-by-second. Second. Jesus walked with God down to the very last millisecond. He is, he was, he walked as the perfect reflection of the will of God in the earth. In John chapter 5, verse 19, the scripture declares, So Jesus explained, I tell you the truth, the Son can do nothing by himself. He does only what he sees the Father doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son also does. Like a reflection in the mirror, Jesus didn't miss a movement of the Father. Jesus walked in perfect alignment with the will of God. And you could walk as Jesus walked if you allow the sanctification, the grace, that power within you, the Holy Spirit to guide you and to lead you. You know, the Holy Spirit's the one who sanctifies us. The Holy Spirit is the one who guides us. The Holy Spirit is the one who empowers us. The Holy Spirit is the one who helps us day by day. And as we yield to the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, as we yield to that process we become transformed to be more and more like Jesus. That's my prayer. Lord, let my hands be your hands. Heal through them. Work through them. Let my mouth be your mouth. Speak through me. Let my eyes be your eyes. Let me see everything as you see it. Let my ears be your ears. Allow me to hear your voice. Let my feet be your feet. Tell me where you want me to go. Let my being be your being. Let my heart beat as one with yours. I want to disappear in your will. I don't want them to see me when they look at me. I want them to see Jesus. John 3.30, I must decrease, but he must increase. How do you do that? It's by following the leading of the Holy Spirit because you cannot strive your way into being like Jesus. You can only surrender your way into being like Jesus. Let me say that again for those who may be struggling with the bondage of legalism. You cannot strive your way into being like Jesus. You can only surrender your way into being like Jesus. It is by the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5. We'll read beginning at verse number 16. You know, those who are led by the Spirit don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. They don't walk in the flesh. So maybe the key is not necessarily in trying to perfect every little flaw, but instead walking in sync with the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying, for clarity's sake, I have to say this. 
I am not saying that we embrace that wrongdoing. I am not saying that God will wink at sin or overlook compromise. I'm simply saying that the way to overcome it may be different than you thought it was. Sure, you should exercise willpower. Sure, you should use practical tools like accountability with fellow believers. Sure, you should try and exercise your free will to make decisions that keep you from temptation. But do all of that while remembering that the power to live like Jesus comes ultimately from the Holy Spirit. He will help you as you go, but ultimately it's him. Let's actually read John chapter 14, verse 9, before we go into Galatians 5. John 14, 9 says this, Jesus replied, have I been with you all this time, Philip, and yet you still don't know who I am. Anyone who has seen me has seen the Father. So why are you asking me to show him to you? When you look at Jesus, you see that reflection. When you look at Jesus, you see the reflection of the Father. May it be said of us that when people look at us, they see the reflection of Jesus. How do we get there? Let the Holy Spirit guide your life. Galatians 5, 16 and onward. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Stop there. This is something that requires your participation. This is what I mean when I say flow with the Holy Spirit. This is what I mean when I say surrender to the Holy Spirit. It's obeying the directions that come from the Holy Spirit. It's submitting your nature to the nature of the Holy Spirit. In order to fulfill the will of God, you have to obey the word of God. In order to become like Jesus, you have to obey Jesus. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Some might say that there's nothing that we can do to prevent the work of the Holy Spirit within us. That's not entirely true. Sure, ultimately, he will accomplish his work because we've been redeemed. But as we exercise our free will, we yield to the process of what God is doing within us. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. So often... We, we focus on the sin nature. And again, I want to emphasize this because I don't want anyone to take my words out of context. You should do everything within your practical power to resist the flesh. You should do everything within your practical power to resist wrongdoing. Your, your, your effort, your planning, your mind, your thoughts, everything about you, you should use to resist that work of the flesh. Yes. But remember that we should be more focused on living by the Spirit than by not living in the flesh. Why? Because if you live by the Spirit, by default, you cancel out the work of the flesh. So what's the key? I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Let Him do it. Obey, trust, yield, Flow with him. Then what's the result? Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature... The results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that any, please hear this, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. So when someone lives that way, it's proof that the Holy Spirit is not working in them. But the Holy Spirit, by contrast, so that's what happens when you're not redeemed. That's what happens when you are a false convert. That's what happens when you're not truly born again. But the Holy Spirit, what happens when the Holy Spirit is working in us? What happens when you are a child of God? But the Holy Spirit produces. Who produces? The Holy Spirit. He produces this kind of fruit in our lives. 
love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, that's selflessness. Joy, that's contentment with the presence of God and the happiness that comes from that contentment with that which is eternal. And there is peace. This is peace within, peace with others, peace with God. Patience, this is the ability to endure with the right attitude. Not just endure, but endure with the right attitude. Kindness, this is in how you treat people. Goodness, this is moral excellence and upright character. Faithfulness, this is consistency. This is reliability. This is keeping your word. This is having the character upon which people can depend. Gentleness, this is humility. This is to see yourself in the proper perspective in comparison to who God is and self-control. It is mastery over self and cravings and desires. And when you live this way, now you begin to walk in favor. Now you begin to walk in power. Now you begin to walk in such a way that everything aligns, right place, right time, right people, right conditions, right attitude, down to the right weather. I don't care what the detail is. When you live this way and you're led by the Holy Spirit, you're not constantly trying to force things, nor are you trying to fight things away. So you're not trying to make things happen and you're not trying to prevent things. You're just flowing. And you're moving with the Holy Spirit. You're walking in obedience and God begins to direct you. And God begins to bring the right things along and the right people along and the right connections. And please hear me when I say this, the right disconnections. But it all flows from this place, that, that peace, that fruit of the Spirit that begins to develop in you as a work, not of your own works, but as a work of the Holy Spirit. Who produces the fruit? The Holy Spirit. Scripture says that clearly it couldn't be more clear. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified them there. Since we are, so now he's speaking to believers, since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. This means that that fruit, the nature of Christ, that submission to God's will, has to affect every area of your life. Let it affect your parenting. Let it affect your marriage. Let it affect the way you do your job. I'm just going to I'm just going to talk about this for a second. I might get in trouble, but I this needs to be said. It's the truth. We have a problem in our culture today. People are just lazy. And you see it in the way that people attack the idea of a job or working too hard. Now, I'm all for rest. That's a biblical principle. But we have to have balance. And there's this attitude that many, some Christians even have, that a job is beneath them and that they should be celebrated for doing what the Scripture requires of them because the Scripture talks about being diligent and working. And so if you don't work, you don't eat is what the Bible says. But we have this culture that more and more is beginning to disdain work and they're confusing um, responsibility that can add pressure with torture that causes trauma and those aren't the same things. So we as believers not only must be led by the Spirit in our parenting, in our marriage and in everything that we do, we, we should be led by the Spirit in the way we do our jobs, because the scripture says you do everything as unto the Lord. Oh, you know, these corporations, I, I can be lazy on the job because these corporations have enough money. I, I know I'm touching on something here. These corporations have enough money and they're not paying me what I'm worth anyway. And I'm thinking you agreed to work there for that rate. You took the job. You accepted it. Why? Because you needed it. And so this idea that we just kind of do things half-heartedly and we commit time theft and resource theft simply because we think the big bad guys upstairs in the boardroom don't deserve it are, are, are all, that's just not godly. And I know it's countercultural to say that. I know I can get in trouble for saying that. I know that will upset some people because it's been pushed and, and it, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's propaganda is what it is and it's, it's, it's trying to change the mindset of a generation. That's, that's not you know, the whole topic of this message, but that's one thing we certainly should be led by the Spirit in the way we do our jobs, the way we work. Why? Because it's a reflection of your character. How you work in that job says more about you than it does about the people in charge. Now, I'm not talking about enduring actual abuse or corruption. 
Just leave if that's the case and trust that the Lord will provide. But you know, we so often complain about these things and then we go on reflecting fleshly nature and we feel justified in it because the ego is so inflated. We think it's beneath us. That's one area. Many people are not led by the Holy Spirit. Be led by the Holy Spirit in the way that you take care of the temple that he's given to you, your physical body. What know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit and ye are not your own? You've been bought with a price. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. How are you treating the Holy Spirit's temple? How are you treating that physical being which hosts the manifested presence of the Holy Spirit? The indwelling presence of the Holy Ghost in your being. How are you being led in what you watch? How are you being led in what you listen to? How are you being led in your conversations? How are you being led in discerning false teachings? How are you being led in the discipline of your day-to-day -day activity? How are you being led in how you budget your time? How are you being led in how you budget your finances? How are you being led in how you serve at church? How are you being led in how you interact with individuals? Are you reflecting that kindness? Is the fruit of the Spirit showing? We are to be led of the Holy Spirit in all our ways, in all aspects of our lives. To be led by the Spirit is to become more like Jesus. And for your spirit to take control and have, I think a better way to word it is, for your spirit to have more influence in your life. Romans chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 5 and onward. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. Did you hear that? You want to know one of the signs that you're not being led by the Spirit? All your thoughts are sinful. Thoughts of bitterness. Thoughts of entitlement. Thoughts of lust. Thoughts of negativity. Thoughts that are deceptive. Thoughts that are perverse. Those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things. It's a great test to see if you're led by the spirit of the flesh. Just monitor your thoughts. Observe your thoughts. What is going through your mind constantly? But those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit, watch this now. Those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Okay, what is that? That's the Word. That's what is lovely. That's what is true. That's what is pure. That's what is noble. That's what is heavenly, otherworldly. Now, I'm not saying that you can't interact with this world or even enjoy some of the things that God put in this world. I'm not talking about being so disconnected from this world that you're disconnected from the reality of this world. After all, God created this world and gave it to us. So to pretend like we should deny the existence of the material realities, that's just to live in an unrealistic way. We, as believers, do, however, have to stay focused on the things of God. What dominates your thoughts? This is a great indication of whether or not you're led by the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. So the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. That is such a key that's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember that those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to Him at all. You know that saying, oh, we're all God's children. We all belong to Him. Here the Bible says just the opposite. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you haven't received Christ, you don't belong to God. Not in the way that... Not in the way that you are adopted into his family. Verse 10, and Christ lives within you. 
So even though your body will die because of sin, the spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. What a powerful thought right there. We can just expound on that all day. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give. Watch this now. Listen to the language being used here. He will give life to what? To your mortal bodies by this same spirit living within you. That means your physical body, the flesh, as we call the physical body. Remember, by the way, side note, sometimes the word flesh is referring to sin nature. Other times the word flesh is referring just to the physical body. Here, it's talking about the mortal body, the, 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 the flesh as in the body, the physical being, which is not entirely sinful. It can be used for sin or for holiness, but that depends upon how you exercise your will. Therefore, so we, we receive power in our mortal bodies. That means the Holy Spirit works in us even now. And he's helping you to overcome cravings and lust and, and those old habits of the flesh. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. What a liberating thought. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, you will live for all who are led by the Spirit are children of God. So how do we have that? Well, far too many Christians are led by their emotions thinking that they're led by the Spirit. Now, immediately this produces like a defense mechanism within the individual because they say, of course I'm led by the Holy Spirit. But this is where pride can really prevent us from making progress. Write this in the comments. Pride prevents progress. Why? Because pride will never allow you to admit the areas where you need to grow. So let me just say it to you bluntly. You need to become more like Jesus in one area or another. So do I. I'll put myself right there in, with, 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 in there with you. We all need to be more like Jesus. All of us have something that needs to change. And day by day, we better reflect that glorious image. But if we are to be led by the Holy Spirit, we have to know his voice. We have to know his voice. And therefore, we cannot be so easily swept up by emotionalism. I need, to, I need to tell you this. And again, please don't allow the flesh, that ego, to, to cause this defense mechanism to kick in. Of course I'm led by the Spirit. I'm never led by my, my emotions. None of us get it right all the time. Even some of the most gifted prophetic people I know who are so accurate it's scary are fallible. They miss it. Even, even those who know the word with great precision in one area or another can miss it. And so all of us have to have the humility to admit that we too can at times mistake our emotions for the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we do it more often than we realize. We judge from the exterior. We judge based on personality. Uh, we judge based on our preferences or we judge based on how we feel or what mood we're in. You have to know his voice. How do you know his voice? I'll give you three practical keys for knowing his voice. Remember first that in 1 Samuel chapter 3, when Samuel was called by God, he didn't at first recognize the voice of God. God was speaking to him. He didn't know it was God. He thought it was his mentor, Eli. And so it's possible to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit without recognizing that it's him. In fact, many times we do this in hindsight, where we will, we will remember a moment and say, oh my goodness, that was the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Where we'll remember a moment and say, oh my goodness, he was talking to me then, I just didn't notice it. And often we recognize in hindsight how often the Holy Spirit tried to get our attention, but we were going so fast, we were so distracted, we were so consumed by what we desired that we just moved along, totally ignoring the Holy Spirit, leaving him off to the side and just moving in the flesh. 
So it's possible that you hear him and not recognize him. Really, there are only three voices that will speak to you. The voice of the spirit, the voice of the satanic, and the voice of the secular. And I would say maybe there's a fourth, the voice of self, but self can be wrapped up there in the same category as the secular. Self and secular, they don't necessarily contradict the word of God. They contradict the nature of God, which is more subtle. The satanic contradicts the word of God. But the spirit aligns with both the nature and the word of God. And so you have these voices constantly speaking to you. Maybe in this world today, you are confused. So many message, messages coming at you from so many different directions. And, and there are all these different ideas being thrown at you. And, and you're on social media. There's a hundred different preachers and a hundred different opinions on any given topic. And there are political opinions. There are social opinions. There are spiritual opinions. There are moral opinions. There are theological opinions. There are your family's opinions. And then there's what's coming through the airwaves on television, through music, through TV shows, through movies. And all of these systems and all of these voices are speaking all at once, shouting over one another. In that chaos, sometimes it's difficult to recognize the voice of the Holy Spirit to be led by him. So how do you know his voice, recognize his voice, hear his voice amidst the crowd? Well, hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit is not a skill to be acquired. It's not a skill that you can just be taught. You can receive teachings on hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying it's more nuanced than that. It's not a skill in that I can give you a list of things that will help you to recognize the voice in the sense that I can describe its qualities. Like, for example, let me tell you what I mean. Let's say I'm in a room with about 30 people, and we're all talking at once. Now, you and I meet together pretty much every week. So let's say your job is to pick my voice out of a crowd of 30 people. And if we're all talking at once... You could possibly, if you tune in often enough, you can possibly hear my voice in the midst of that 30 people. And you would say, that one sounds like David over there. That sounds like him. But if you were to just describe my voice to one of your friends who doesn't watch me, and then they have to pick me out of that crowd, they wouldn't fare so well. A more specific example, let's say your mom, your dad, your child, your sibling, your friend, one of your closest friends, you talk to them all the time. You know their voice. Let's put them in that room with 30 people. Everyone's talking at once because you know their voice. You'd be able to tell immediately. However, if you explained the quality of their voice, the sound of their voice, the tone of their voice to some stranger and then told them they had to pick them out of that crowd, it would be near impossible for them to do that on description alone. And that's what I mean when I say it's not a skill to be sharpened. I can't just tell you, oh, his voice sounds like many waters, or it's a still small voice, or it's very authoritative but loving. And all of those things are true. But even given those descriptions, you wouldn't be armed with exactly what you need. And if I did that, then now I just systemized it. And every time you hear something that's still and small or like a quiet whisper, you're going to think it's God, even if it's just a quiet thought that you're having. So it's not a skill to be acquired. It's a sense to be sharpened. How do you explain hearing to a man born deaf or sight to a man born blind? You can't do it. Even if you did, it would be inadequate to explain an entire sense that's missing. So when you were born, you were born with hearing. You were born with sight. You were born with senses. No one had to teach you to see, but you did have to learn to observe. No one had to teach you to hear, but they did have to teach you to listen. And so it's something that you, as a born-again believer, already have that ability to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. You were born again with spiritual senses. And those senses now begin to become sharpened. How? Silence and stillness. Matthew 6, 6, Jesus tells us that when we pray, we need to go pray quietly, privately, 
where no one else can hear us or see us. There's something to seclusion in prayer. There's something to removing distraction. There's something about going before the Lord when no one else is around, about carving a time out of your day where nothing else matters. And in so doing, you begin to silence the other voices. You, you silence those distractions. And then there's this inner peace that comes when you begin to worship the Lord, when you begin to read the word. There's this inner peace that comes, this inner calm now, to where silence is the putting away of outer distraction and stillness becomes the quieting of the soul. And now the secular voices are not speaking. You've worshiped the Lord. You've gone into a place where you're now totally focused on him. And the voice of Satan has been silenced. The voice of the flesh becomes still in prayer. The voice of the flesh becomes quiet when you read the word. The voice of the flesh goes mute when you seek Jesus, when you worship. So now... All the voices that were speaking, when you go to pray privately, worship, read the word, they begin to go silent. Inwardly, you become still because of the worship and the word, and you're meditating upon the word. And now, all that's left is the voice of the Holy Spirit. So you need to know the practice of silence and stillness. You need to be in the word. In John 15, 1 through 8, Jesus talks about the fact that he's the true grapevine, and that we bear fruit as we abide in him. Well, how do we abide in him? We abide in his word. Look at John 15, 7. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask me for anything you want and it will be granted. That's how you abide. You, you know, when you pull, pull out the scripture, when you read the word and you have it there before you and you're, you're receiving, John chapter 6 makes it clear that, that the words that he gives us, aren't, they're not just words, they're spirit and life. So when you read your Bible, you're not just reading a book. You are fellowshipping with a person. Please hear me. When you read your Bible and you have the Holy Spirit in you, you are not just reading a book. You are fellowshipping with a person. You, you, are, you are abiding when that word is becoming a part of you. Even if you don't see it working, even if it doesn't seem like it's transforming anything, e even if it doesn't seem like it's, it's, it's causing any change in you, doesn't matter. Something is happening when you're in the word and you're just abiding, abiding, abiding. And then you obey. So you practice silence and stillness. You get in the word, you abide, and you obey. Why is the Holy Spirit going to give you step two if you haven't obeyed step one? This is why obedience is important when it comes to hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit, you have to know his voice. How do you know his voice? Practice silence and stillness. Get in the word, know the word, and obey the clear instructions of Scripture. Also, make his joy your priority. You want to be led by the Holy Spirit, make his joy your priority. Obey immediately. Write this in the comment section. This might sting a little. Delay is disobedience. Delay is disobedience. When you talk about sensitivity to the voice of the Holy Spirit, it's not just about how clearly you can hear him. It's about how responsive you are when he speaks. Let's say you have a sensitive tooth and you're drinking a glass of ice water. The moment that that ice cold water hits the sensitive part of your tooth, there's a reaction. Why? Because you are sensitive. Sensitivity to the Holy Spirit is reactive. Where the moment he is grieved, there's repentance. The moment he is grieved, there's repentance. The moment he speaks, there's obedience. The moment he's leading you, you act. He says give, you give. He says pray, you pray. He says stop, you stop. He says connect, you connect. He says disconnect, you disconnect. He speaks, you move. You need to practice responsiveness to the Holy Spirit. Don't delay, because the more you practice delay, the longer that delay becomes when he speaks. The more you practice delay, the longer that delay becomes when he speaks. And you have to be willing to make sacrifices. 
Listen, and you know, I, on, 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 on somewhat of a side note here, I hesitate to use the word sacrifice because technically anything that we give to God, he returns to us and then more so or replaces it with something so much better. So I wouldn't even necessarily call it sacrifice, but, but we'll use the term because it's the one people are most familiar with and I think it conveys the message I'm trying to communicate. Namely, that there are times when you're going to feel inconvenienced. There are times when you're going to feel like you're losing something. There are times when your heart will ache for what God does not want you to have. There are times that your heart will ache for what God does want you to have. And, and these are the things that we must go through as the Lord prunes us and processes us. He is the potter, we are the clay. We mold as he moves. We have to be willing to make, like Abraham giving up Isaac. You know, sometimes God will bless you just to test you, to see if what you have is more important to you now than himself. Luke chapter 22, verses 39 and onward. Then accompanied by the disciples, Jesus left the upstairs room and went as usual to the Mount of Olives. There he told them, pray that you will not give in to temptation. He walked away about a stone's throw and knelt down and prayed. Now this is Jesus in the garden. Knowing the suffering before him. Knowing the pain he would endure. Knowing the torture he would undergo. Father, if you are willing... Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then an angel from heaven appeared and strengthened him. He prayed more fervently. And he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. You've heard it said that you know it's God or you know it's the Holy Spirit when you feel perfect peace. Peace is not always a feeling. It's a knowing. It's a certainty. Just because you have peace doesn't mean you won't know pain. Do you think Jesus lacked peace when he was crucified? No. Why? Because peace is a fruit of the Spirit. But was Jesus in agony? Absolutely he was. Being led by the Holy Spirit isn't always going to feel good. Being led by the Holy Spirit isn't always going to mean that you enjoy what you're walking through. Sometimes it will require that you pray as Jesus prayed. Not my will, your will be done. There are areas in our hearts that we don't want anyone to see and we don't want to give to anybody. There are things in our lives that are unyielded to the work of the Holy Spirit. And we fight God. And there's great stubbornness. Scripture often referred to the disobedient as stiff-necked people. Just won't budge. And, and these areas that we cling to, these, these things that we... We try to keep away from the influence of the Holy Spirit. They are destroying the peace. They are destroying that joy. And maybe the Lord is asking you to sacrifice and you're just holding on. And maybe the Lord is telling you to take a step and you're just hesitating. And maybe the Lord is asking you to clean something up and you won't clean it up. Maybe the Lord is calling you to higher commitment and you're just keeping your commitment at the level that's currently. 
What happened to the surrendered life? Why don't we hear anymore about the death of self? Life yielded unto God. A life poured out like a drink offering. But every drop to where we say, Lord, spend me for your glory. And, and, and we resist and, and, and we, we bargain and we plead and, and we try to negotiate. And, and God says, just trust me. Just give it to me. You'll find that when you finally let go, please hear me, people of God. You will find that when you finally let go, what caused you so much fear won't even be a thought in your mind. You'll find that when you finally step out in faith, God will meet you there. He's going to meet you there. Nevertheless, not my will. Your will be done. I surrender all. Say that to the Lord right now. I surrender all. In fact, type that in the comments. I surrender all. Father, by your Holy Spirit, teach us to yield. Speak to us clearly, Lord about those areas in our lives that are not yielded to you. Speak to us clearly, Lord. Show us what's next. Now, don't rush this. Even as I'm praying, there's the temptation. The flesh is being drawn away to other things, entertainment, distracting videos. Focus on what the Lord is doing here. Say no to the flesh. God's doing a work here. I want you to pause for a moment and just yield. When was the last time you just stopped to actively listen for instructions from the Holy Spirit? So, Lord, we surrender. We give it to you, Jesus. He's speaking to you now. He's speaking concerning those areas. Give it to him. Lord, I thank you that your power is moving. I thank you that you're bringing deliverance and healing. Let them sense the warmth of your presence even now in the mighty name of Jesus. their lives in a fresh way in Jesus name listen if you think others need to hear this message please share this please leave a like because that will help to spread the message all around the world and let's you and I stay connected I truly believe that God brought you here for a reason let's stay connected make sure that you subscribe to this channel and click the bell so that you don't miss a thing also remember that this content is created and then distributed for free because of generous supporters like you. Be led of the Holy Spirit in your giving now. Don't fight him, flow with him. Do what he tells you to do. You can give a single gift by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash donate or become a monthly ministry supporter by going to davidhernandezministries.com slash partner. Whatever you do, just obey the Holy Spirit and give what he tells you to give. And as I said, that's how you can pay it forward. That's how you can help this content reach more people. Help us continue to produce it and host events around the world that Jesus may be glorified. Thank you, and until next time, remember, nothing is impossible with God.